yourself credit for. And if you have something that's going on in your life right now that's challenging or painful, it's just a reminder to take a little bit better care of yourself. Because you're worth it. You can have this feeling. on in your life right now that's challenging or painful, it's just a reminder to take a little bit better care of yourself, because you're worth it, you can have this feeling anytime you choose, you might be giving yourself credit for it, and if you have something that's going on in your life right now that's challenging. Mercy on your people. Uh, have mercy on them for their for their for their unbelief and their unfaithfulness. And so, verse twenty, where we're going to read, I'm going to read the scripture and I'm going to tell you what our subject's going to be. Verse twenty, the Lord replied, "I have forgiven them, Moses, as you asked. Mm-hmm. I was going to do it. I was going to wipe them out, but because you plead on their behalf, I've forgiven them. Nevertheless." As I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Y'all play too much. (laughs) Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on earth on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a, get this, a different spirit. Yeah. And follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to. And his descendants will inherit it. I want to focus on that verse 24 for because that's what the Holy Spirit wants me to have this conversation today about courageous faith. It said, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and followed me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land and his descendants will inherit it. I want to use a subject this morning. I'm built different. Look at somebody say, I'm built different. I'm, I'm built different. Father, bless your word today. I stand back and ask you, God, to step up, permeate this place. Yeah, overshadow this place with your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you take your seat, look at my, look at my I'm built different. I'm built different. I was going to introduce myself. I'm built, I'm built different. Please be seated. Human beings are social animals. And like all social ha- animals, we have an amazing way of syncing up and coordinating our behavior. You ever notice that? We tend to experience things as a collective. What typically affects one group of people or a community or a person tends to affect other people as well, sometimes for no apparent reason at all. For example, if I started yawning in here, <sighs> inevitably somebody else is going to start yawning. You ever notice that? If I burst out laughing in here, that suddenly some people will start busting out laughing, even if they don't know what I'm laughing about. We're we're collective. We tend to experience things as a group and as a collective. Have you ever noticed this, that that when a mother becomes anxious, for example, on a personal level, becomes anxious in the presence of a stranger, that so does her infant child, that without even knowing why, just picking up on the anxiety of of his mother, They will start acting, even if they don't know why. They don't know why they should be afraid. It's just that I am taking on the anxiety of the village that I live in, of the person who nurtures me, and so the child is anxious. Managing your emotions is important as a leader. That's why managing your emotions is important as a leader, because the people who follow you tend to take on your persona. And so if you're anxious or nervous or unsure If you're a leader and you're somebody who's not in control of your emotions, it can have an effect on the people that follow you. That as a leader, sometimes you got to keep your own feelings in check. That as a leader, people shouldn't be able to know exactly what you're going through. That's, That's one of the qualities of leadership, that you can take a licking and keep on ticking. 
that you don't have the luxury of bleeding on the people that you lead. And it's not that your leaders are not people as well. They have issues as well. They have struggles and challenges and issues as well. But as a leader, you have to have the dexterity to put aside your issues, put aside your problems, so you can effectively lead the people that you're in charge of. I have a bunch of deer that gather behind my, behind my house. And I noticed this, that if you spook one deer, they all take off running. <laughs> Same with people. You ever seen this? You ever seen people running? I, I was watching on YouTube while I was studying for this, and, and I saw this, this prank that these young people did where it was a group of young boys, and, and they decided to just take off running for no reason at all, as fast as they could, as if something were chasing them. And they ran through a crowd who were just meanderly, leisurely walking around, just minding their own business, and they took off running as fast as they could, as if something was chasing them, and inevitably, the people in the group started running too. You ever seen that happen? I mean, we don't even know what we're running from. <laughs> I just saw you running, and I took off running too. The assumption is something dangerous is coming, something's chasing you, something's after you, and without asking any questions, with having no evidence, I just took off running because you were running. Sometimes this tendency works against us and for us. Researchers think this is the psychology behind groupthink, Brother Moore. Groupthink occurs when groups of people form an opinion based on, get this, a group consensus. The group has agreed to feel this way, to respond this way, and rather than thinking critically about the information that is being presented to me, like the runners, rather than seeing what's chasing me, I decide to take on the group reaction until I realized I don't even know what we're running from. <laughs> group think occurs when group people form an opinion. Some psychologists believe that mass hysteria, which is an extreme form of group think, is the episode of collective fear around a threat that may or may not exist. That fear is contagious. And so it is a contagious social emotion that is run amok. That you can get a group of people in a room and panic and fear can hit that place until the whole place is filled with a spirit of fear and some of the people are afraid and don't even know why. That there have been examples all over history of mass hysteria. Whole groups of people, whole communities, whole organizations who have taken on an attitude or a position or a posture and don't even know why. Some of you are the same way that sometimes we have family members that because we are in that family, we don't like certain groups of people. That's how prejudice works. We don't like certain groups of people, certain segment of people, and some of you don't even ask yourself why. I just don't like the east side. Why? Because my parents always say stay out of the east side. I don't like white people. Why? Because my parents said don't like white people. I don't like black people. Some of the things that we don't like is justified, but some of it is just you taking on the opinion of the village that you're raised in. Y'all with me this morning? When all the group members develop a common fear that spirals into panic, that is group hysteria. Fear is contagious. Fear is a spirit. Even young animals which have not had the wisdom of experience will take their cues from the village. And left unchecked or unchallenged, whole groups of people, whole groups of organizations, ministries, departments, and families can be negatively impacted because people can become trapped in a cycle of fear that makes you miss out on, get this, miss out on love, on opportunities, on promotions of positive experiences, that sometimes when you take on other people's prejudices and ideas and attitudes that are not your own, you take on the negativity that comes along with that and you miss opportunities yourself because you are a victim of groupthink. You have not critically thought about the information that's being presented to you, you just went along with the crowd. You just decided that you were gonna take on this attitude because everybody else has and sometimes it works against you because sometimes the group is going in the wrong direction. 
Some of you parents know what I'm talking about. When you talk to your kids about peer pressure, you tell them if little Johnny jumps over the bridge, are you going to jump over the bridge too? You're trying to warn them of the dangers of peer pressure and taking on other people's attitudes because sometimes those attitudes are wrong. So in our text, that's what's happening. We're witnessing the result of groupthink and mass hysteria that resulted in a missed opportunity to go into the promised land. The Israelites had already escaped Egypt. God had miraculously delivered them from the enslavement of their slave masters. They had successfully made the journey across the wilderness, and here they were standing on the edge of everything that God had promised them. Moses sends out 12 spies to check out the land and confirm what God had told them. Go over there. God's been talking to us about this promise. Go over there and get some evidence, get some proof. Go over there and check it out is what he told them. When the 12 spies returned, they all agreed. Check it out. They all agreed that the land was flowing with milk and honey. They all agreed. Every, all 12 of them went over there and said, oh, my God, it's just like God said. All this milk, all this. They brought back evidence, proof that the thing God had said actually existed. They got to taste the grapes, the, 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 the sign, the proof of what shall come. Sometimes God gives you commercials to whet your appetite for what shall be. Is there anybody understand what it's like for God to give you a vision for your future? You can't come into it yet, but he just gives you a vision, a commercial. He lets you taste it. That's how faithful God is, that God won't just have you out there starving for something that never exists. Every once in a while, God will give you a taste Mwah. just to whet your appetite. Oh, my God. This is just the appetizer. I can't wait to have the meal. This is, just a, this is just a lead up into it. This is just God getting me ready. I'm getting my napkin out right now. I'm getting my bib. I'm setting my table. I'm getting my plate ready because God's about to feed me on a whole nother level. Is there anybody excited here about what shall be? You haven't moved into the job yet, but God has already showed you what shall be. You haven't met your person yet. You haven't got the job yet. The business is not off the ground yet, but I've come close enough to taste it. God doesn't give you a taste to frustrate you. He gives you a taste to motivate you. Is there anybody here who God has waking you up in the middle of the night with dreams about things that you haven't even seen yet, but you're excited about it. You're so excited that you're getting your life ready, your money ready, your body ready, because whatever God has promised, it shall come to pass. Look at somebody and say, it shall be. So 12 spies went over there, and they confirmed, and they brought back evidence. But here's the problem. Ten spies gave a negative report of what they had experienced. They agreed that there was a flow of milk and honey, but the 10 spies also said this. They said, but, anytime you hear somebody say, but, you know it's about to be a problem. <laughs> I'm in love, but. <laughs> I got a great job, but. I got a new opportunity, but. It's that but that gets us in trouble. Come on, Brother Tony. It's the but. It's that but. If you just left it alone with just we had milk and honey, we tasted the grapes, we might have made it through this. But it's that but that left the door open for something else to creep in. And here's what they said. They said the people who live there are powerful. They're stronger than we are. They're more numerous than we are. The cities are fortified. They're large. Look how, look how they exaggerate it. The land devours everybody who lives there. Now we're going to build on it. We're going to, we're going to embellish it. <laughs> the land eats up everybody. Here's what's interesting thing they said. They said, all the giants live over there. Oh, my God. And look here. We are like grasshoppers compared to them. It was frightening. And this information spread throughout the whole nation. There were some people that suggest at this time, that there was upwards of a million and a half people that was in the wilderness at this time. About the same population of the, uh, the Nashville metro. So imagine all these people that live in the Nashville metro, we're in the wilderness. So it's about that many people. And they were all affected by this negative report. Ten men affected a million people. Ten people. It wasn't even a whole lot of people. It was only ten men who came back 
and impacted the attitude of a million people. Ten men took off running and a million people started running behind them. Not even knowing why, not even seeing anything, and listen to this negative report. It's too big, it's too strong, it's too wide. We can't make it, we can't take it. It swallows up the land. And this messed up and influenced an entire nation. I want to stop and ask you this. Isn't it amazing how fast negativity can spread? That good news travels fast, but negativity travels faster. That if something good happens, few people will share it. Even in this church, while we do great work and great ministry and lives are changed, that few people will share it. We take a moment in our service and we have everybody to share on their social media. Take a moment, share it, like it, tag it. Because we know something good is going to be said or something good is going to be done or something good is going to be testified about that. We want people to know good things are happening here and few people will share it. But let something bad happen. <laughs> let something nefarious happen. Let something crazy happen. It'll spread like wildfire. Then while we're struggling to tell somebody, push your share button on your phone, we almost have to twist your arm to do it. But let something weird, crazy break up. Let the pastor do something crazy, God forbid, and suddenly I'll be famous or infamous, however you want to put it. Because good news travels slow. It's on the slow boat. But bad news travels fast. I wonder what would happen. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if we started sharing the good news that's happening in this church. If 10 people can affect a million and a half people's attitudes, wonder what 10 people in this church could do for this city. My Bible tells me in the book of Acts that if two believers got loose in a city, they would turn the whole place upside down, Brother Tony. It didn't even have to be a whole lot of disciples. If two people got loose, if two believers got loose in the city, they would turn the whole place out. My Bible says that one will chase a thousand. That two will chase 10,000. Wonder what would happen if the number of people in this room today ran out of here and went to talking about and bragging about, as Sister Daphne did, bragging about their church, their pastor, this ministry, and the great things that are happening for you in this church. Why is it that we're, like we spoke about last week, that we're bold about talking about bad stuff, but shy and timid when it comes to good stuff? That if somebody gets healed in the service, blessed in the service, set free in the service, gets saved in the service, we'll say nothing about that. There's no Instagram post, there's no Facebook post, there's no YouTube post, but let something crazy break out, child, let me tell you what happened. Something about our nature that does that. So here's the thing. As a result of this negativity that is spread throughout the nation, now this is not just a couple of folks, a couple of folks we deal with, but this is the whole community. Fear set in. Mass hysteria broke out. The whole nation was up crying all night long. They complained. They rebelled against the leadership. Why would you bring us out here, Moses? You don't even know what you're doing, bruh. Got us out here in this wilderness. It wasn't not enough graves in Egypt. You got to bring us all out here. We look stupid bringing us out here, talking about God, taking us to a promised land. I don't see no promise nowhere. They rebelled against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And here's what they did, Sister Adrian. They went as far as they wanted to choose a new leader to lead them back to an old situation. That's what fear does to you. That's what panic does to you. That's what frustration does to you. They blame their situation on the leadership and they wanted to find somebody to take me back to what's familiar, what's normal. That there are some people who rather than push forward into the new thing will find somebody, hire somebody, pack up their stuff. We're going back to Egypt. They forgot the whips in Egypt. They forgot the enslavement in Egypt. They forgot the mistreatment in Egypt. We're going to actually find somebody and take us back to the old time way. 
The old time way is the good way. The old time church is the good church. We got to fight. I don't like this new pastor. I don't like this new leadership. I don't like this new direction that they're trying to take the church in. I got to find me somebody to take us back to the old time way. You forget that you were miserable, that you were tired, that you were frustrated. You forget that some of you left ministries because they were considered old school. Now you get in a new school church and you want to make the new school into the old school crazy these people these people hadn't even seen the giants they only heard about it and they took off running without even knowing what was chasing that's crazy 10 people came back and told us and they took off running that's how some of us are now that you have detached yourself with negative people and small-minded people and small-minded individuals and what we call small groups to strengthen you, you've turned them into small groups that cripple you. That what's crippling you is your circle. That it's possible that the people that you insist on affiliating with are keeping you small. That we set up small groups in this church to strengthen your faith and take you further and connect you to the vision, but you have used it as an opportunity to lead us back. To what once enslaved us. Look at somebody. I'm not going back. Listen, any direction is better than back. I can't go back to who I used to be. I can't go back to the same attitudes. I can't go back to the same places. I, why would God take me back into something that he just fought to get me out of? Why would God take me back to the people? Why do I insist on returning to the people and the places and the situations that broke me? But that's what they wanted to do. You got to be careful about hanging around with fearful thinking, fearful living, and fearful speaking people because their fear can rob you of the courage you need to succeed in life. It's not that you're being funny. It's not that you're being mean, but it takes so much energy, so much effort. So much courage just to get up in the morning and get in the car to go to the job and fight through the things you got to fight through. The last thing I need is somebody in my ear reinforcing the negativity that I had to fight my way through just to get there. Now y'all sleep this morning. Are you with me? The last thing I need is somebody. I got enough devils of my own. I got enough demons of my own. I got enough issues of my own without you giving me some extra problems to add to the issues that I had. Now I got to fight through the voices in my head. Now I got to fight through the voices that you're telling me. And all this stuff is in my spirit making me unsuccessful. I'm weighted down with the junk. The junk, the gunk, the mess of groupthink. Look at somebody say death to groupthink. Some of you, the thing that's keeping you from going forward, it's not you, it's your group. It's your circle. It's your clique. It's your crew. And I know you don't want to say it, but some of them are keeping you from living your best life. Being your best individual. Being your best person. I could be better if I didn't hang around such negative people. I could be on the next level if I didn't insist on surrounding myself with people who don't want anything. Don't do that. It might not work. Don't try that. Don't go over there. You know what happened to the other people. You got to get away from negative Nancys. Come on, somebody. That's why in this church we insist on praise. We have issues, we have problems, we have challenges, but when we come into the house of the Lord and we have our worship service, it is designed to lift the atmosphere, to lift the spirits of people, to build people up. We are not in the business of tearing people down. We create an atmosphere where people feel lifted. Somebody feels lifted right now. Give God a crazy praise right here. I feel a lift. I feel a lift in the building. I came in burdened. I came in worried. I came in frustrated. But now I feel a lift. Somebody that feels a lift, give God a shout right here. I feel lifted. I feel lifted. Negativity. Spread. Contagious like wildfire. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Joshua and Caleb, instead of following the majority now, went against the crowd and said, let us go up at once. Sometimes when everybody is going in a certain direction, it feels like the whole world is against you. 
I want to talk to somebody right now who's in a situation where you feel like the whole world is against you. It's really not, but it's just your world. It's the few people that you uh, associate with or hang with or, or, or communicate with. It's, it's the couple of people on your job that can make you feel like the whole world is against you. You ever notice that? It's just a couple of your neighbors that can make you feel like the whole world. It ain't everybody in the church. It's just a couple of people that can make you feel like the whole church is against me. I find when people leave church and leave ministries, it's not that it's the whole church. It's not all of y'all. It's like one or two people, maybe somebody crazy in the back of the room who ain't got no sense, and you have judged the whole quality of the ministry, the vision, the direction of the ministry based on two people feeling like the whole church is against you. The whole church don't even know you. <laughs> feeling like the whole world is against you. And they said, let us go up at once. You know, it takes courage to go against the crowd, to swim against the current, to opt for a more difficult course of action when it would be simpler, brother, more to just go with the flow. Because of their courage to stand up and say, let's go up at once. Wait a minute. You, we, we just told you there's giants over there. We just told you that the whole land devours people. We just told you we were grasshoppers. And here are these two dudes saying, up to them, let's go. Let's do it. Let's get it. Faith filled people are radical, Brother Tony. They don't make no sense at all. I just told you there was something bad back there. Don't you see us running? Yeah, but let's go. Let's do it. And because of their inability to shrink into the mass hysteria. Guess what they wanted to do, Sister Carmen? They wanted to stone them. They want to stone them for wanting more for their life. And sometimes people will stone you because you want more. Because you want more for your family, you want more for your future, you want more for your ministry, that there are some people who will try to make you feel bad and will try to stone you and kill you and kill your dream and your vision because I want more. That your desire, your appetite to live better, to live on another level, to have a different life for yourself and your kids will get on some people's nerves. That they want you to stay low. That some people only like you when you stay low. The moment you decide I'm going to live better, live higher, go further, they start talking about you and putting you down and try to throw water on your dreams and crush your hopes because people can't stand people who have appetite. My appetite is voracious. My appetite is tenacious. My appetite is ravenous for the things of God. I want better. I want to do better. I want to live better. When I open my Bible, it is full of promises that I claim for myself. And I'm sorry if you don't want it. I may have to take you out of my book of people that I talk to because I got to get around some hungry people. Where are the hungry people at in the room? When I come to church, I don't come for entertainment. When I, don't, when I come to church, I don't come to be tickled. I come to be challenged. I come to be fed. I came because I needed a word from God. Everybody that came for a word, give God a shout right here. Shout, Lord, feed me. But I want to warn you, hungry people, they'll kill you. Yeah, they'll kill you. They'll stone you. It takes courage to be a leader in anything. It takes courage to be an industry leader. It takes courage to be a ministry leader. It takes courage. You can't be no ministry leader and be no wimp. It takes courage. We all should wear blue. No, we're not wearing blue. Why not? Because we're not doing that. But if you're going to be a leader, you can't be led by the crowd. Leaders lead from the front, not from the back. And if you're somebody who cannot be strong enough to stand flat-footed and stand with your decisions and say, we're going forward, then you are not qualified for leadership because it takes courage to be a leader. To be an industry leader, to do something that nobody else is doing takes courage. Most people, when they do something new, they laugh first. And then when it works, they celebrate. Most people, when you come up with a new idea, with a new product, they don't celebrate first. They laugh at you first. But how many know that God's going to let you have the last laugh? You laughed at me first, but you're not going to be laughing later. Back then, you didn't want me. <laughs> now I'm hot, you all on me. 
There's some of you right now, they're laughing at your dream and laughing at your look. They're called a little vision, your little vision. Anytime they call it a little vision, that means they're laughing at you. Oh, I'm praying for your little vision. They're laughing now, but God said they're not going to laugh later. Look at somebody and say, they're not going to laugh later. Do not make the mistake of judging the quantity or the quality or the magnitude of my ministry based on the seed that I'm living in right now. Do not make the mistake of judging something too soon. The problem with some of you is people are judging you too soon. They're looking at the seed that you have, but they don't see the tree that's going to come out of it. Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to go against the, against the flow, against what's popular, against what's traditional, against what's normal, against what's expected? Being a follower is easy, y'all. There's no struggle. Being a follower, all you got to do is go with the current. Go with the flow. But if you want more, you're going to have to swim against the current. Some of you are in this church right now because you want more. And you left churches and you left organizations and you left ministries. And people who you left are talking about you right now. Because I want you to stay in tradition with me. I want you to stay with what's normal. I want you to stay in this organization and do what we do, even though it's choking you. Some of you are in organizations and in groups, in cliques that are choking you. And rather than get out for dear life, you'd rather stay there and choke. But all the people that want more shout, I want more. I want more of God. I want more of his presence. I want more of his glory. I want more of his word. I want y'all not going to talk. I want more of his grace. I'm not satisfied to just be in the church. I have to be involved in my church because I want more. Shout, I want more. There are certain fish that as part of their reproductive cycle can be seen swimming upstream. There are certain fish like trout, I believe, and salmon who will be seen jumping up into waterfalls going forward. They go back to the place of their birth to lay their eggs. For the survival of their species, they got to go all the way back to the place they were born, to the still waters of their birth, so they could have children to go forward. And some of you right now, you're going to have to swim against the stream. You got to swim against the current. That you have to have the inner fortitude to swim against the crowd and swim against the current. So the Bible says this about Caleb. I'm where I want to be now. It said that Caleb had another spirit. When millions of people are going in one direction, God says about Caleb in particular that he had another spirit. Now get this. What's it mean, another spirit? It means he thought differently, Adrian. He was a critical thinker. He was a free thinker that Caleb processed differently, that when other people were moving in fear with no information, Caleb took the time to process the information, to think about it. He was a free thinker, a critical thinker, and because of that, he, was a, he had a different attitude. It made him a standout, a man of distinction. Write this down. It made him a warrior and not a warrior. Look at somebody and say, I'm a warrior. I'm not a warrior. I don't turn my head off and just follow you just because you said, let's go. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to process the information. I am strong enough to stand in my own thoughts. I am strong enough to stand on what I think about it. I receive the information. I receive the facts. I receive what you're saying. But I am strong enough to process what you're saying, to think about what you're saying critically, and make decisions about my life that will impact my future. Many people turn off their brains when it comes to information. Whether it's politics or church, that's why people get caught up in cults. You turn off your head and just going to follow something without thinking about, why are we going over here drinking this Kool-Aid? You don't think, just drop it down. Why are we following this particular political belief? You don't think about what they're saying, you don't read what they stand for, you just vote for people because it's on the list. But smart people, intentional people, process the information they don't just join things out of emotion. I thought about it. So write this down. 
I want to talk about the things that made Caleb different. I'm almost done now. Number one, his perspective was different. The reason the ten spies came back with an evil report was for two reasons. It was how they saw God and it was how they saw themselves. First of all, they saw the problem bigger than the solution. They saw the problem bigger than the solution. To them, the risk was greater than the reward. And to be honest, that's what keeps a lot of people from going forward. When you compare what you could have versus what you could lose, that some people are so afraid of what they will lose that they will not go after what they could have. That what they could lose outweighs the possibilities of what they could have. I could be successful. You could fail. But the question is, what if you win? If you try to endeavor, yes, it could fail. It could fall apart. It might not work, sis, but the question is, what if you win? What if you go for it and actually hit it? What if you shoot at a target and actually hit the goal? We're so conditioned to handle failure that we don't even know what to do with success. And some people are so addicted to failure that even if they're succeeding, they will still, they're indulging self-sabotage and start doing things to sabotage the success they have. You've been hooked on drama. That's why you ruin all of your relationships. You're hooked on failure. That's why if you get a promotion, you'll do something stupid to get yourself fired because to you, Failure feels normal and success feels foreign. But all the people that are ready to go to success shout, I'm ready to go to success. God is bigger than any problem that I have. I'm not saying I don't have problems. I'm just saying that God is bigger. I'm not saying there aren't any giants there. I'm saying that compared to the God I serve, these giants do not compare. Second problem they had was how they saw themselves. And this is a really big issue. They said they saw themselves as grasshoppers, as grasshoppers, Tony. That means compared to the problem that they had, they saw themselves as insignificant. You got to watch the way you talk to yourself. A victim mentality will cause you to use words and terms and phrases that will shrink you. I was ministering to somebody not long ago, and they were telling me about the issues that they were having on their job. And the way they described themselves in the situation really disturbed me. They were saying things like, they're picking on me. They're picking on me. They're, picking on, they're, they're making me feel small. They're making me feel, why, why, why? They're bigger than me. And, and it got on my nerves. And I said, stop, 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 stop. Listen, why do you keep talking as if they're bigger than you? Like, okay, they got a bigger position, but they're not a bigger person. It's sometimes the words that we use that shrink our mentality, that make us feel small in the face of problems, that in the face of the problems, you start calling yourself a grasshopper. I'm too small. They're picking on me. Why do you think so small of yourself? The things you tell yourself, I'm a victim. They're picking on me. They make, and so now because of, it's not just what they're doing, it's what they're saying to you that's making you sick. That's making you depressed. That's making you frustrated. It's not even the intensity of what they're doing against you. It's the intensity of the words you're saying to yourself. That the record that you keep playing in your own head about how powerless you are, about how small you are, about how insignificant you are, and to them, the, they are huge. They are like giants, and you come in acting like a grasshopper, insignificant. But Caleb had another spirit. Caleb had a whole different mentality. De Caleb thought differently. He said, yeah, I see the problem, but I see the magnitude of my God. Is there anybody in here that can accept the fact that God is bigger than your problem? Testify to somebody and say, your God is bigger than that. He's bigger than diabetes. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than divorce. He's bigger than homelessness. He's, look, you, you ain't telling somebody. Look at somebody. He's bigger than that. He, the reason you're depressed right now is because you think your thing is so big and you're so small. Sometimes it's not about how you see God. It's about how you see yourself. 
that the real issue may not be how you see God, but the real issue is how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as significant, as important, as relevant, that you can stand up and say, I'm somebody if you fire me. I'm somebody if you leave me. I'm somebody if you walk away and don't support me. I'm still somebody. Look at somebody and say, I'm still somebody. <laughs> Number two, I want to talk about his posture was different. The way Caleb approached the problem was different. That while others cowered, he said, we will devour them. We're going to eat them for lunch. We're going to eat this up. That when he looked at his problems, he said, this is lunch for me. This is going to feed me. When everybody was saying, Lord, child, don't do it. We can. He said, where's my lunch at? The problem is some of y'all don't realize that God has prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. It is possible that your enemies are the lunch. He just brought your dinner to you. This is Uber Eats coming to your house. You didn't have to come get it. It'll be brought to your house. This is lunch. You're running from your lunch. You're running from the thing that God sent to feed you. You're running from the thing that God sent to empower you. You're running from the thing that God sent to strengthen you. Is there anybody ready to eat up in here? Shout, I'm ready to eat. Talking about God bless me. He's going to put some enemies in front of you and say, let's eat. Caleb pulled out his fork and his knife and said, boys, let's eat. Ten people said, oh, no, we can't do it. Two of them said, let's eat. Look at somebody and say, let's eat. Let's eat. Stop complaining about your issues. Stop complaining about your problems. Stop complaining about your boss, your kids, your health issues. This is God preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemies. If you don't have no enemies, you don't have no table to eat on. Oh, my God. People think that courageous means you're unrealistic. That you're ignorant, that you're blind to the facts, that you're blind to reality of the situation. But in contrary, being courageous doesn't mean you're oblivious to the risk or the danger. We just approach the problem differently. What made Caleb think that he could even do that? The Israelites were not fighters. They were farmers. they have been slaves for 400 years. They weren't an army. They were a mob that came out of slavery. And somewhere down in this boy was something that rose up like a warrior and made him believe that the God that I serve can make me stand up against giants and Amorites and Hittites. It was God in me. Something stood up in him. Why? Because God had proven himself many times. Over and over, God proved himself to him. Ten times, God said, in the world, I have done things over and over for you. And God's telling somebody here, I've done so many things for you, you should have no question, no doubt as to whether I can do it again. So that's somebody said, God's going to do it again. Everything God took you to do is just building your resume. Everything God allowed me to experience was me building up my resume. So when this devil jumps on me, I got a resume. I got experiences. I got things that God did for me. If he brought me out of that, he can bring me out of this. If he fed me when I didn't have a job. If he healed my body in the hospital, if he healed me from cancer, if he healed my child, this thing I'm standing in right now is nothing but lunch for me. Y'all, y'all don't want to shout in here. The same God that brought you out of something is the same God that can take you into something. I'm trying to tell somebody that God would have never brought you out of it if he couldn't take you into something else. That if he wasn't going to take you into something new and fresh and exciting, he would have left you in prison. But the same God that broke you out of that prison will break you out of another prison. Give God a shout if you hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Hit about three people say, I'm built for this. I'm built for this. When this devil jumped on me, you better check my resume. I didn't just start doing this yesterday. I didn't start doing this last week. You ain't jump on no novice. You ain't jump on somebody that just started preaching, started ministry. I got a resume. Look at somebody say, you got a resume. The Bible says they overcame the devil in Revelation by the word, by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony. That sometimes when the devil attacks you, 
you got to throw your resume at them. You got to throw your testimony at them. Is there anybody here that's got a testimony? All right, let me just check the room. Is there anybody in here that's got a testimony? Is there anybody here that God has brought you out of something miraculously, that God made a way for you, that he opened a door for you, that he gave you a job, that he blessed you with a good marriage, that he gave you a good job, that when everybody else was saying, ain't no good men out here, didn't God bless you with a good man or a good woman? Oh, y'all not going to talk to me today. That, that when they said they couldn't get a job and the business won't work, that God blessed you, all the people that got a testimony, give God a shout, I got a testimony. You ain't testifying. That's why the devil defeats many of you. Because you sit back, but everybody's got a testimony. Jump on your feet and say, I got a testimony. Find you about three people and say, I got a testimony. I know we don't do testimony service no more, sis, because we ain't got time. We on a schedule. But would you find about three people and say, I got a testimony. I ain't got time to testify about the time he gave me a job when nobody would give me a job. I ain't got time to testify about the fact that they thought cancer was going to take me out. I ain't got time to testify about the fact they thought my kids couldn't learn. I ain't got time to testify about the fact that I was walking and God gave me a car. Y'all not going to talk to me. I ain't got time to testify about the fact that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic addict, but God delivered me and set me free. Is there anybody in here that's got a testimony? You ain't got no testimony. You ain't got no testimony. If you had a real testimony, we had to shut this service down. If you had a real testimony, if you started going over your resume, we had to shut the service down right now because praise will break out in this room. Somebody's glad God blessed you. Give God a praise right here. Last thing, and I'm done. Caleb's persistence was different. Here's the phrase for me, Brother Mark. He said, the Bible said he wholly followed the Lord. That means he followed him all the way to the end. That once he got involved, once he got in the game, that he stuck with it all the way to the end. Some people start good, but they don't stick with it. Some people get in the game, but they don't stay with it. Can I be honest with somebody else? Going to get on some of y'all's nerves. Some people just don't do long-term relationships. They just don't do them. That some people don't appreciate the value of long-term relationships. In particular, this generation, we celebrate people who quit, but we don't celebrate people who stay. Michael and Carmen are starting a marriage ministry in our church because we recognize the need that our ministry, that our marriages needed help and ministry. Because we got all this information out here teaching you how to get a man, but not how to keep a man. I'm going home. That all kind of stuff, child, wear this, wear that, pull it up here, put it down there. All that stuff to tell you how to get somebody, but ain't nothing out there to tell you how to keep somebody, to teach you how to stick and stay. <laughs> this generation in particular, we celebrate people who quit. That if you quit, we celebrate you. We'll throw you a divorce party. <laughs> party hardy, child. We will party all three times you got married. We throwing a party. <laughs> that's how we are we teach people we see see this is what i believe behavior rewarded is behavior repeated and the reason why this generation tends to quit everything is because we reward people who leave you don't like something leave you don't like it get out you don't want to be there run run and there are some times that you have to make some decisions, but that's not all the time. That's not all the time. And so we're so accustomed to leaving that staying is foreign. So we're working with our marriage ministry because we want to teach people the motto of stick and stay. Oh, ain't nobody shouting on that. Uh huh. Stick, look if I say stick and stay. Listen, listen, the Bible says this. See, 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 I, I got to give you this Bible. I gotta, see, see, we always talk about leave, child, get out, run, walk away, quit the job, quit the ministry, quit the church. And so we have a very loosey-goosey relationship with churches, with ministries, organizations. It's a very loose covering because we had bad experiences. But my Bible 
celebrates people who know how to stay. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We celebrate people just packed up and left. But my Bible tells me all the time in the word of God, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. And so this generation celebrates being, mo- being mobile, being loosey-goosey, being, you know, kind of lucid. You know, heavy. So, so, so some of us have a difficult relationship with relationships. Some of, you, some of you are dating people, and I want to caution you. One of the questions you should ask the person that you're seeing is how long was your last relationship? That's a good question. Because some people just don't, it's not that, it's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. They left you, but they come in the relationships punching the clock. Connie, they come into the date punching the clock. They do. They come in. They already know already this is going to last about three months, three weeks. They count down the moment they take you out. They don't plan to stay. They don't. They don't. They don't plan to be with you. I'm going to be with you to get you through Valentine's Day, uh, my birthday, Christmas, and after about three weeks, I'm done. And it's difficult to build with people who have that kind of lucid relationship with people. So you need to ask, how long was your last relationship? Relationships do last. They do end sometimes. I understand that. But how long was it? Some people are, there it is, they're serial daters. <laughs> I don't plan to even be with you long. I'm enduring this. And as soon as I got in, I was looking at my watch saying about, about a week. <laughs> y'all laugh because you know I'm telling the truth. About a week. About two weeks. Nothing wrong with you. You think it's something wrong with you. Maybe I wasn't pretty enough. Maybe I wasn't smart enough. Maybe I wasn't, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, committed enough. All these things you say, I'm not enough. Sometimes it's not even you. It's them. They have not been brought up in an environment where they appreciate long-term relationships. And so to them, it's always about the new thing. It's always about excitement. Not just men, women too. You're, you are caught up in experiences. And as and, 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 and long as the experience is fun, it's exciting, we're having a good time, I'm with it. But in any long-term relationship, sometimes it's going to be difficult, it's going to be challenging. And so if you're somebody who's only going along for experiences, you just stay there until the experience is not fun anymore. It's not fun anymore. No now I'm with Jim. Some of them are even so lucid that you'll have a different person on every day of the week. Monday is Fred. Tuesday is John. Wednesday is Mark. Thursday is Bill. I might circle back to Bill on again on Friday. It was so nice I did it twice. But next week, we got a new... (laughs) Y'all looking at me funny. So we don't stick with anything or anybody long enough to get the real benefit. The same thing is true in church. Some people have a very loose relationship with church. If, If they ever join, they don't get involved. It's a very lucid relationship. I was talking to some friends over the weekend, and we were talking about how millennials... Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to talk millennials into home ownership because you know in our generation we value home ownership we got a piece of land with our name on it and that's my land that's it I got a piece of this property but the millennials have a different approach to it they, they, they don't like to feel stuck and it's hard to talk them into the value of equity because they value mobility they value being able to move around. I don't like this part of town. I'm leaving. And so trying to talk them into home ownership is really an uphill battle because they value mobility over equity. They don't want to feel stuck. But there's a difference between being stuck and being stable. Stuck implies I'm in something. I have no options. I can't get out. I'm just stuck like Chuck. But there is something great about being stable. Being stable means I'm consistent. I'm reliable. I'm somebody that you can count on. Even the credit bureau recognizes credit history. When you go to get a job and look at your resume, they like to see job history. They're checking how long. If you're the kind of person who can stay on a job more than a week. Some people's resume look like a minefield. 
Now you want me to be committed to you, but you have a reputation of being somebody who can't commit for more than a week. <laughs> so we have a lucid relationship because we understand. I, we were talking with the men last week, uh, Brother Moore. We went to breakfast with all the men. All the men in here shout and say hallelujah, hallelujah. All the men. We, 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 we had a breakfast with them, and one of the things that I shared with them, I said, man, guys, men have to be able to stick and stay. Real men pray and real men stay. Don't no woman want to be married to some man who can't stay. Every week, you can't keep a job. You can't keep a job. All these get rich quick ideas. I don't like this job. I quit. I don't like it over here. I got to go. I know sometimes we have to change jobs and change careers, but that shouldn't be every week. Come on, man. You got people depending on you. You got bills to pay. You got a wife that like to shop. You got kids. <laughs> you, got, you got kids that like to eat. You talk about I quit my job. You quit your job. You quit your job. The number one quality that a man should have is that I can stay. I'm stable. I'm steady. I may have to change direction or change course, but it is calculated and it is intentional. And I don't leap before I have something that I'm going to leap to. Come on, somebody. When you're leading people, when you're raising a family, when you're raising a house, you have to be able to stick and stay. Tell somebody, stick and stay. Ain't nobody got time for nobody that's going, you're going to be a leader for a week and then you're going to quit and then you're going to be a member for two months. And then you, you need somebody that can stick and stay. Come in here with all this bravado and I can't find you next week. Ooh, ooh, I'm sorry. Caleb had to wait 40 years, Brother Moore. 40 years he had to walk around in the wilderness with these people and it wasn't even his fault. Because of their unbelief, they had to wander for 40 years. And Caleb, for no fault of his own, had to follow around with people who was going nowhere for 40 years. Hanging around with people that didn't want nothing, that didn't want to go nowhere. And the whole time, the Bible says, he wholly followed the Lord. He kept his eye on the prize. He stayed focused. That was a different kind of spirit. Because the average person would have bounced. They would have dipped out. They were, I'm going to another church. I'm going to follow another vision. Because as soon as things don't go the way you think in the timeline that you think it ought to go, people bounce. They out. But Caleb said, God put this in me. God put me here. God put me in this place. God put me in this position. God put me in this marriage. God put me in this space. And I'm going to stay here until God fulfills his word toward me. I know y'all don't want to hear that. Y'all want me here. Leave him, child. Get out. Run. Take off. But the same power it takes to leave is the same God who will give you the power to stay. Y'all not going to talk to me in here. Look at somebody and say, God says, stand still. Forty years, he had to follow around with these non-believing people, grumpy people, angry people, putting up with them, Daphne, but I'm going to still hold on to God. Eighty-five years old. Eighty-five years old before he was finally released to go after his promise. And here's what he said. He said, give me this mountain. Give me what was promised to me. I'm 85 years old, but I still got the strength of a young man. I'm telling you that a man will never die as long as he has a twinkle in his eye. Did you hear what I said? As long as you're still hungry for it, as long as you still want it, as long as you still got desire for it, God will fulfill his word towards you. Here he is, 85 years old, still killing giants. I'm telling somebody that you will never reach your promise until you face your giants. It may be delayed, but eventually God took him back to the same giants he saw 40 years ago. Only this time, he was with a different group of people. He was with from upwardly mobile people. He was with some people who had vision, who had purpose. Who had, some of you, your ministry is on hold because you're with the wrong people. That really God had to wait until you were around the right people. 
Is it possible that God has delayed some things and put some things on pause because you wasn't with the right folks yet? And do you have enough patience to wait for God to work out some other issues? That sometimes when God puts your life on pause, it's not because of something you did. It's because he's working out some other things that some people may have to die out. That some people may have to peel off. That some people may have to walk away. That some new people may have to be introduced. That I know you see the vision and the future, but I can't let you go in yet because you're not with the right people. When you get with the right people, everything that's been held up and held back is going to suddenly be released. Lift your hands and say, God, release it. Is it possible that I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people in the right situation that the person standing next to me, that this is a setup. Oh, my God, that this church is a setup, that this ministry is a setup, that the person I'm sitting next to is a setup. Slap to my say this is a setup. It's not by accident that you're here. It's not by accident that we've connected. It's not by accident that I'm in this city. It's not by accident that you came to this church. God has put you with the right people at the right time. And everything that's in you is about to be released. Oh, my God. I feel something about to hit this place. Somebody shout release. That's what God said to somebody. I'm about to release your tongue. I'm going to loose your ministry. I'm going to open up doors for you. I'm going to bless your business. I'm going to take you to the next dimension. If you believe it, jump on your feet and give God a mighty shout in this house. Connie, I'm finally in the right place at the right time with the right folks in the right atmosphere. And when you get the right people in the right place at the right time, ain't no telling what's going to happen. Find you about three people and say something's about to happen. Something's about to happen. Oh, they, they're not talking to you. Find somebody else. Find somebody who's fired up. Find somebody who's excited. Find somebody who believes it and touch them and say something's about to happen. My God, when you get in a room full of spirit-filled people who believe in God for a breakthrough and you touch them, it's like electricity. Something begins to break loose. Father, I say break loose. break loose, break loose, break loose. Everything's about to come up because you held on to it, because you held on to your faith, because you held on to your anointing, because you held on to your integrity. God's about to do something in your life. If you're glad about it, give God a shout right here. I wish I had a church. Laugh at me if you want to. I've been waiting on this. Laugh at me if you want to. I've been waiting on this breakthrough. I've been waiting on this promise. I've been holding on. I've been praying for it. I've been hoping for it. And now! Angela, 85-year-old Caleb, he didn't look for the easy job. He looked for the mountain. Where most folks are looking for the easy stuff. He looked at the mountain where they have a reputation for having giants. He picked the biggest thing. You know what I found out about a bully brother more? That when people bully, I used to have bullies in my neighborhood, Sister Adrian. And I used to have a group of friends in my neighborhood. And they was bullies. They was real bullies. And one time, and I was scared because a bunch of them all the time. They, they were like dogs to me, like wolves or something. He walked down the street and come out of nowhere. And I'd go run home to my dad. And my dad said, Who's the biggest one in the group? Who, who's the biggest one in the group? And I told him his name. He said, this is what you're going to do. Invite him over to the house and close the door. And by himself, wear that fool. <laughs> I'm trying to help somebody. Because you running from stuff that should be running from you. He said, find the biggest one of them and get him by himself and wear that fool out. Daphne, I closed that door and I locked it and I shocked him, brother, for because I jumped on him like a cat. I jumped on him like a cat. I jumped on him like my life depends. I was in sissy fight because I was going. <laughs> one of us ain't coming out of here. Went off, oh, brother Moore. I found out he wasn't as tough as I thought he was. It was all in my head. I found out I was quicker than him. My arms were longer than his. I was stronger than him. And when all the other people heard about it, they stopped fooling with me too. 
Hey, Derek, what's up, boy? What's up, my boy? Why? Because it was the biggest problem I jumped on. And once I prove to the biggest problem, you don't scare me, everything else had to lay down. God said to tell somebody, don't back up off it, jump on the big. When that giant falls, everything else is going to fall. When that financial giant falls, everything else is going to fall. Slap somebody say, everything else is going to fall. You ain't got to fight all of them. Just get the biggest one. And go in on them. Slap somebody say, everything going to fall. 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 Let me close with this. Let me close with this. He said, Caleb, you and your descendants are going to inherit all this. You can stand on your feet. We can ready to go. Stand on your feet. We can ready to go. Here's the thing. He said, you and your inheritance are going to, your descendants are going to inherit this space, Caleb. If you hold on, if you maintain your different attitude, I built you that way for a reason. That sometimes it's not about you. It's about your future. It's about your kids. We are breaking generational curses. Truth be told, your kids need to see you fight and win. To break the spirit of fear in their own minds, they got to see you fight and win. That sometimes when you're fighting these devils, you're fighting them so your kids won't ever have to. I'm in the wrong church. That, that if you're not glad for anything else, be glad for the fact that your kids, it won't be as hard for them as it was for you because you had the nerve to face those giants. Oh, my God. I break the giant of poverty. I break the giant of disease. I break the giant of depression. I break the giant of addiction. It will not be in my kids. It will not be in my grandkids. I'm going to break the addiction in me so it won't be in them. I got to break my drug addiction so it won't be in my son. Oh, my God. I got to break the sex addiction so he won't have to deal with it. Lift your hands and say, God's breaking some stuff. God's breaking some stuff. God's breaking some stuff. Your kids need to see you win. They need to see you fight and win. You can't whimper. You can't back up in a corner. My brothers, your sons need to see you stay. They need to know how to go through a difficult relationship and still make it work. They need to see you get up in the morning and go to a job that you don't like to bring home the paycheck. To pay. They need to see it. My sister, you got to teach these young women that you got more going for you in their mind and not your behind. That old school philosophy, baby, use what you got to get what you want, it is dead. I am more than this body. I can think. I can reason. I'm smart. They need to see you getting ahead without using your sexuality. That's why they need to see you praising God. Because they're asking you, how did you do it, mama? How did you make it? How'd you make it over? What did you do? You know, who'd you lie to? Who'd you sleep with? And the only thing you can say is that I praise my God. Praise bought me here. You see this car? Praise bought this car. Praise bought this house. Praise got these shoes. Praise bought these clothes. Praise bless this business. Praise raise my ministry. Is there anybody in here that can demonstrate what it takes to be a winner? Caleb was a leader from the tribe of Judah. And Judah means praise. It was only made sense that the praisers were the conquerors. 
If you want to know who the real victorious people are, it's the praisers. It's the people who have reckless abandon. How are you going to stand up bold in front of Pharaoh when you can't praise God in a room full of saints? But I want all my praises to take over this room right now. This is how you made it. This is how you made it this far. Don't get here and get new school now. It was praise that brought you this far. Don't get new now. Don't act like you're going to be cool and sedity now. I want all my praises to take over this room. Take over this room. Praise the God of our salvation until salvation begins to come down. Praise God until giants begin to fall. The devil's not afraid of your shoes. He's afraid of your praise. He's not afraid of your degree. He's afraid of your praise. He's not afraid of your car. He's afraid of your praise. Press your way into it. Press your way into it. I like what Sister Daphne said. She said, I didn't feel like it, but I pressed my way into it. Sometimes you got to be persistent. Sometimes you got to be mad about it. Sometimes you got to show up. If you got to pull one leg in front of the other, I'm here. I'm tired, but I'm here. I'm lonely, but I'm here. I'm frustrated, but I'm here. I'm tired, but I'm here. Tired of these saints that say, come to church when they feel good. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. At his praise. I praise him when I feel good and I praise him when I don't. I praise him when I got money and I praise him when I don't. I praise him when I'm tired. I'm built for this. I'm built for this. I'm built for this. God been getting me ready for a long time. I'm built. You think you're going to punk me and make me go home, baby? I'm built for this. I've been getting ready for a long time for these kind of devils. It's not so much. I've been getting ready for this devil. I've been getting ready for this devil. I've been getting ready for this devil. Uh-huh. 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 Somebody put those hands together and give God a praise in here. I'm built for it. I'm built for it. I take a licking and I keep on ticking. I've been slapped in a corner and pushed in a wall, but I keep coming out of it because I'm built for it. I got another spirit. I got something else on me. This is church unusual. It's not supposed to be usual. If you want normal and usual, you at the wrong church. This is church unusual. We're built. Slap three people and say, I'm built for this. I'm built for this. God made me able to do this. God made me able to handle this. God made me stand up to it. God made me. I'm strong. You're stronger than you think you are. Somebody that knows God's about to give you the victory. Give God 30 seconds of your best praise right here. Depression is falling off. Worry is falling off. Church hurt is being healed right now. God delivering somebody. Somebody give him a shout right here. Come on, church. Let's have church. The devil said you wasn't going to praise him. The devil said all the stuff you got going on, you wasn't going to get no shout out of this room. But I want somebody to make that devil out of a liar. If God's been good to you, give him a shout right here and right now. Excuse me while I praise him. Excuse me while I praise him. For all the stuff he brought me through, excuse me while I give him a glow.
How many about three people say, I'm built for this? I'm built for this. I'm built for this. Whatever I got to face tomorrow, I'm built for this. Whatever I got to deal with this week, I'm built for this. I'm here for it. That devil jump out the car, I'm here for it. That devil try to show up on my job, I'm here for it. That devil try to run me out of this church, I'm here for it. That devil try to make me walk away from my blessing, I'm here for it. And just... Hey, I'm Pastor Derek Faison, and I am the lead pastor for the Impact Church of Nashville. I just want to say how glad I am that you have stopped by our YouTube channel. You're going to find some great material on this channel that's going to help you and challenge you in your walk with God. Keep coming back. Make sure you subscribe. Share as many videos as you like. This vehicle is what we've chosen to be the place where we could continue to do discipleship, mentoring, training, and teaching. Also, you better keep up with any place I'm speaking around the country, around the city, or around the world. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you subscribe, and share with your friends. I just wanna welcome you again to our YouTube channel. challenge.